that's a very good answer, I think. Um, one thing I've noticed, this is a very small point uh, about the physical, um, the built forms and their relationship to future possibilities uh, for migration or, or difference. Um, I, I've now noticed on drives to the airport that uh, new subdivisions actually are not going up in the old style, uh, but they're building multi-generational family homes so that um, one generation comes and buys the house, acquires the, the property, and then um, the generations that, the, you know, the, the elders and the, and the youngsters who are left behind successively are brought over to, to live in Canada in a single home. So you have, you know, four generations in a single house, which is a, a, simply a, a built form that wasn't available in either of the models that, that you mentioned just now. And it should be. A lot of these high-rise apartments have these problems because when you settle in a country, uh, and, and people say, oh, this is the tradition in this or that country. This is how they do it in Bangladesh or whatever. But the fact is, it's how, it's how, it's how people do it when they're new. Um, I'd say the, uh, the rural English peasants who formed squatter town enclaves on the northern outskirts of Toronto at, around the time of the First World War. In fact, a third of the population of Toronto was self-built shantytown housing with English and Welsh people. Uh, living in it around the time of the First World War. So we don't, shouldn't think we're superior to Mumbai. We had exactly that same formation. Uh, those villagers uh, will, had multi-generational housing in that way too. So it's not a specific ethnic characteristic. It's a characteristic of new arrival. Nevertheless, people who newly arrive, and this is a case of the market taking care of it, which I, doesn't happen as often as some economic thinkers would like to think it would. Yeah. Um, and one of the great problems of these high-rise enclaves is that they're built with the idea of a young couple and one child moving out from downtown. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you have a need for a multi-generational uh, family. I could use some of that multi-generational housing, actually. I think we're all falling back into Well, that. yeah, I speak as someone whose um, um, stepdaughter is moving back home after graduating university, which um, it would be nice if she had her own wing, because, uh, you know. <laughs> And then, yeah. yeah. My, mother, um, my mother in law stays with us uh, about half the year and so on. There you She's go. here, by the way. Oh, okay. Hi, Mildred. <laughs> <laughs> we love our parents and our children. <laughs> Just for the record, since we're being taped. Um, uh, following on, just to push this a little bit farther, um, the, 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 you know, the rhetoric of integration has been subjected to, to um, some quite uh, nasty manifestations. Um, I was struck by the fact that towards the end of your book, you, you picked up on uh, a kind of alternative or at least parallel rhetoric, which is about hybridity. And that's where I, I wanted you to say more um, now, because the, the idea is, in, in very crude terms, that um, among, other, among other things, it's evolutionarily advantageous for us to diversify and not to halt interbreeding and cross-pollination in any population. Um, and it does seem to be, furthermore, on less kind of global terms, does seem to be politically effective and contribute to stability, civility, and respect to have more um, differences folded in rather than maintained in any given population. Um, do you think that that really is the future? Because this is where some of the optimism of your book, which I mentioned before, though cheering to me, I wasn't sure that I actually was convinced that it w was likely. Yeah, I, I, I... I don't like to think of it as so much of as an optimistic book as, as one that points out that uh, human communities do tend to want to organize themselves in ways that work and succeed, and their failure to do well, so. Well, Hobbes, Hobbes would say that was optimistic. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more Kantian than Hobbesian. <laughs> and uh, um, that they want to organize themselves that way, and, and it, it's barriers put in their way that, that, that do this. Now, there's, there's, there's a whole world of thought about, uh, about hybridity and mongrelization and so on that, that you could probably give a better lecture in than I could. Uh, and that tends to be very rosy-cheeked and so on. Um, and uh, the question is whether the war of civilizations rhetoric uh, and view of the world is the one that is coming to dominate these transitions, or whether it is more the hybridization one. Um, we can look to the antecedents in Canada and, and be somewhat optimistic. Um, what happened with the Italian and Portuguese waves is not that we were all forced converted to Roman Catholicism and, uh, and so on, but that we all ended up drinking espresso, eating, eating a lot more garlic. And, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, and that was a case of us, us, us assimilating to them, if I can kindly use the us to refer to my own ethnic community. <laughs> and, <laughs> and trust me, growing up, we didn't have much espresso or garlic. And, uh, um, and uh, there, there is a critique called the uh, ethnic restaurant school of integration thought, which is the that which is actually something that gets discussed, which is the, the belief that among uh, liberal-minded people that simply because you can go out and get five flavors of ethnic food at the, with a single phone call, it means that everything's worked out all right. Um, and there are deeper tensions there. I would say that the more extreme versions of the War of Civilizations version of events uh, cannot possibly work because they mathematically don't work. We know for a fact that you don't get swamped by people coming in. Um, that people's birth rates within a generation fall to the same level of, of the receiving society. So, and the places that are sending people are themselves having birth rates falling very quickly. So the idea of, of anyone being swamped isn't quite working. Let's put it this way, if, if the countries that have the fastest falling population rates are Iran, which went from having eight children per family in the 80s to having 1.7 now because of this urbanization process, and Turkey and Italy and Poland, which uh, at least three of those are among the most religious societies on earth. Uh, Pol I would think you could safely say that Poland and Italy are quite religious, and Iran is Iran. They have the fastest falling populations. I would say that a certain model of life in, in which the, the extremes and the dangerous are going to take us all over or are going to come into conflict, uh, that model doesn't work. There's another scenario where the subaltern become the threat to, to society, where the people coming in because they're poor and so on. And I should say that places like Canada are pro I very much doubt are going to be able to keep their immigration strictly wealthy people. Um, we're not doing it now uh, because four to five immigrants are the relatives of those highly skilled people that we really like, and those relatives don't tend to be uh, wealthy university educated elites. And I think any efforts to tell uh, highly skilled engineers and x-ray technicians that they can't bring their families with them is going to cause us not to get any of the desirable people we want. Uh, so we are going to have people who are poor. And if uh, the economies stop working, as has happened in some parts of Europe lately, and uh, people remain poor, then you're going to get resentments. Although the resentments are very often in the opposite direction, because uh, what, you see, what you see with the more extremist parties in the Netherlands and Britain and so on is uh, not a, a fear of the poor among you, but of the fact that it's, it's your own country's native-born children of the working class who tend to be failing, and it's the, the poor immigrants who are succeeding very much. In East London, uh, it's the Bangladeshis who, after, after a period of difficulty and violence and trouble in the late 80s and early 90s, have become a fairly successful business and university integration story, and the white working class of East London, uh, their children are all welfare cases who live in uh, public housing and so on, and raise pit bulls and so on. I, right. I'm using an ethnic cliche here, but it's... I know, I, I, know, I know those guys, so... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm allowed to do that because it's my group, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been given the sign that we should move to the next stage, but I, I, I can't um, forbear from asking you one final question which has a yes or no answer, and that is, is it not astonishing to you that in 2010, in a city of this complexity and alleged sophistication, that there's not a single mayoral candidate in favor of more bike lanes. I don't think that even needs an answer. That's right. <laughs> All right, um, that, that's my non-paid political announcement for the. <laughs>